This Week in Startups is brought to you by SendPro Online from Pitney Bowes. Save time and money no matter what you ship or mail. Try it free for 30 days and get a free 10-pound scale when you visit pb.com slash twist. Dell for entrepreneurs. Level up your hardware today and save up to 43%. And Twist listeners can get an extra 5% off by going to dell.com slash twist. And Modloft, the only modern furniture brand that offers elite design, fair prices, and delivery in days, not months. See why founders, venture capitalists, and celebrities choose Modloft. Get 15% off and free shipping at modloft.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. Really excited about our next guest because, like me, he's been around for a while, and uh, he's built a lot of apps, a lot of startups. He's got a lot of scar tissue and lessons along the way, and he's going to share them with you today. Uh, my guess is none other than Mike Mazur from Big Sky Health. You may not know the the name Big Sky Health, but if you have been fasting, you have probably been using an app called Zero, which I've talked about all the time. Uh, and you might think that Kevin Rose is the founder of it because he's involved in it somehow. We'll figure out what that involvement is today. Uh, but Mike Mazur has been in the industry uh, since the Web 1.0 days, and he hired an intern, marketing intern at some point, associate, uh, from a Craigslist ad, uh, my good friend Kevin Rose, uh, and then Kevin hired him to go to Dig, a little company that Google was going to buy for a hundred million. At the last moment, Google pulled out of the deal. Brutal. Uh, Mike also spent a bunch of time at Electronic Arts doing all of the big uh, licensing titles and doing the marketing for those. You you know the Lord of the Rings kind of video games. It seems like they made twenty of them. And then went on to create Fitstar, which was bought by Fitbit, which was a really innovative iPad app. And that leads him to today when he is building a little collection of apps, one in meditation, Oak, uh, one of them in mindful drinking uh, to cut alcohol consumption. That seems like something Kevin Rose uh, would benefit from or has his fingerprints on <laughs> uh, called Less. <laughs> I'm joking, Kevin. Uh, but he, you know, he, likes a, he likes a spirit or two. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I think the home run of all home runs, the the leading fasting app, Zero, which, you know, when I use it, seems to have 700,000 people or so fasting concurrently. What What's the usage like? And welcome to the program, Mike Mazur. Thanks, Jason. Great to see you. Great to be here. Yeah. Um, and a great rundown. I should capture that for my own bio. Um, but yeah, Zero is, it's just been an incredible run. And you know, during COVID, we've seen as many health apps um, usage shoot up. So on any given night, you were talking about, you know, people concurrently fasting using zero. You know, we're, we're 850,000. Oh, on, so close to a million. You're, so you close. almost got your second comma. Dose commas coming. <laughs> Dose commas coming. Yes. And, and what's amazing is you can see week over week, um, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are the big, big nights. And then you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, for obvious reasons, it trails off, but it's yeah. around 800, 850,000 on a given night. I noticed it seemed to have doubled in the last six months. Am I correct? Because it seemed like it was at three or 400,000 yeah. at the end of last year. You've doubled in the D last six months, the active fasters? M more than doubled. So December of, of 19 to today, we're more than 2x, both daily fasters and monthly active users. Wow. And part of that is the January effect. You know, people sure. come in, um, new year, new you kind of stuff. And they, and we get a natural bump as to most of the health and fitness apps. But then we saw this, an, another huge tranche of growth, uh, not right at the beginning of COVID. I think at the beginning of COVID, actually we saw down usage because people were, you know, they were freaking out, comfort eating, it, it, yeah. it distracted, they, you know, they were just trying to figure out where the world was going. But then around April, it really ticked up and, and has remained. I guess people got, uh, like I did, I was fasting and then I, that was exactly my pattern. I added the quarantine 15, that was probably less, cool. probably like the quarantine 10. Uh, and then I've been back on the app. And then lo and behold, I had emailed you earlier and said, why can't I pay for this app? Like, there's a <laughs> bunch of features I want, but you're not letting me pay for it. You just launched the paid version. 
Explain zero to people plus. Uh, zero plus, yeah. Explain to people what they get in the basic app, which has been free for a couple of years now, I think, and then what they get in the paid app. Sure. Well, the basic app, and and we should talk about that transition because that was really, you know, one of the most challenging launches I've ever done is taking a huge user base that's been free for years over to a paid product. Um, but in terms of free versus paid, the, the, really the easiest way to think about it is the free product is more of a utility. You can mm -hmm. track your fast. Um, we give you some basic content. You get your biometrics and stats, um, things like that. And, and always the vision for Zero was to provide more guidance. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people, when they're starting fasting, they don't really know what they should be doing, what the, what the protocol should be. Um, they don't know how they might feel during fasting, how to work out, uh, what might happen to their sleep. So with Zero Plus, you get all of that knowledge. So you get, um, you understand a lot of what's happening inside your body when you're going through different phases of fasting. You know, a 16 hour fast creates very different biomechanics and outcomes than maybe a three day fast. Um, so we have this coach feature, which onboards you, it asks you a bunch of questions, kind of what's your fasting history, what are your goals? And then it provides a longitudinal um, program for you to follow and it'll, algorithmically adjust if you're we'll, we'll check in with you on a weekly basis and if you're wanting to push harder and and sort of increase the duration of your fast over time we'll help you do that or we can dial it back and then a ton of content so our chief medical officer peter atia is one of the foremost you know world experts in longevity incredibly humble guy so he probably wouldn't say that about himself but he is and so we have you know hundreds of videos and and audio um, clips and segments and articles that really delve into the science of fasting and also the lifestyle of fasting. So you get all of that with Zero Plus as well as um, really interesting correlations of your data. So you'll see how fasting affects your sleep, fasting affects your resting heart rate, all the things that fasting pretty quickly, I know you've been doing it for a while, can have a pretty quick and dramatic impact on. And so we give you that deeper dive into your biometrics. Yeah, I thought that it was really interesting how when you click on the center of the wheel and you use like a, a sort of like a clock, a circular clock to, um, you know, track your progress, it showed you the phases you were in, uh, you know, going fasting into fat zones. burn. Yeah, the fasting zones. But when you click on that center and you try to learn more about the fasting zones, hey, that's when you get kicked into the upgrade cycle. And it's only 50 bucks a year or something, four bucks yeah, a month, five bucks a month. It's it's actually it's nine ninety nine a month. Okay. Uh, Sixty nine ninety nine a year. Okay. Um, but you know we've had a few promotions. We had a, a big promotion for our existing user base, bringing them over. And yeah, I mean we we were committed again because this we had this huge user base. Most companies don't start free and stay free for as long as we did, or maybe they move into advertising, but they don't make the the subscription ask when you have as big a user base as, as we do in most cases. And so we were committed, hey, let's keep everything free hmm. that was free to, to really reward users who have been with us and not pull the rug out from under them. But it just put the, the onus on us to create a, a, a lot more value in the paid product. And so we're happy if you want to keep using it for free. We're obviously happy if you want to come in and pay. And you know we're in V1 of Zero Plus. It's literally been out for not even eight weeks. And our roadmap is, is super exciting about where we're taking it. Yeah, it seems like uh, it was more than enough to convince me. What is the expectation? What was your expectation ballpark in terms of conversions? 10% of users, 5% of users, and then ballpark, what would a founder expect to convert? Low per single digit percentages, one, 2% convert on something like this? Yeah, I think, you know, what we saw at Fitstar, and that's that was my kind of comp, you know, we saw around 3% conversion you know, on the aggregate, because you've got different conversion rates on Android versus iOS. Um, I think, you know, a really great conversion rate, if you can sustain it, is around 5%. And if you get 5% plus, you're in in kind of rarefied air. Now, of course, it, it differs by, you know, the realm that you're in, the type of app that we're talking about. But, you know, 5% is um, what you want to see. And we had dramatically lower expectations because we had this huge existing user base they've been getting a lot of value from the, the free app many people you know were telling me before we launched plus like you know you're gonna have a really tough time and um we uh, had an expectation of very low single digit percent and um 
you know, we're eight weeks in, but after launch, we've almost tripled our forecast wow. on the upside. That's um, fantastic. So it's been lots of work to do, tons of experimentation. We have an amazing team that's, you know, iterating not only on creating new features and more value, but also, you know, all the experiments that you need to do to get that conversion up. Yeah. Um, but we're, you know, we're really excited about the early results. All right. When we get back from this break, I want to understand pricing and how you determine the price of these subscri consumer subscriptions that apps, because the value of doing a consultation with a dietitian would be the equivalent, I think, of using something like Zero Fasting Plus or Zero Plus, rather, um, which would cost hundreds of dollars a month, at least uh, thousands of dollars a year. Uh, but people also have now been trained to have Netflix uh, or Disney for seven, eight bucks a month uh, or a video game for 50 bucks a year that provides hundreds of hours of entertainment. So I'm curious how you think about the pricing of these new health apps like Calm or Steezy or Zero Fasting when we get back on This Week in Startups. With SendPro Online from Pitney Bowes, you can simply print postage stamps and shipping labels even when you're working remotely. For as low as $4.99 a month, you'll get access to special discounts and save up to 40% off USPS Priority Mail. If you don't know what Priority Mail is, it's amazing. It's such a deal. Plus, for being a This Week in Startups listener, you'll receive a free 30-day trial to get started and a free 10-pound scale to ensure that you never overpay. Some SendPro Online benefits include printing shipping labels and stamps, even when you're working remotely, scheduling package pickups and tracking shipments from departure to arrival, and save up to five cents on every letter and up to 40% off USPS priority mail. Starting at $4.99, you can calculate the exact postage online and print from your PC, avoid trips to the post office. All of this is gonna save you a lot of time and a lot of money. So here's your call to action. Go to pb.com slash twist to access a special offer for a free 30-day trial plus a free 10-pound scale to get started. That's pb.com slash twist, T-W-I-S-T, to experience huge savings in your shipping costs and a free trial of SendPro Online from Pitney Bowes. Thanks again to Pitney Bowes for supporting the pod. Hey, everybody. We're talking about apps, subscription apps, and, of course, fasting with Mike Mazur, the, I guess, co-founder uh, and CEO of Big Sky Health or the founder? Founder. Yeah, founder and CEO. Great. Yep. Um, and so we've been talking a bunch about uh, zero fasting. What is Kevin Rose's involvement in the company? Is a co-founder or an advisor, investor? What what is he? What is his involvement? Because I know, you know, he's. Uh, I see. I saw he was starting the mindfulness uh, like Facebook group when he was starting all this, and I was like watching him experiment. Well, what's the relationship between you two on a business level? Yeah. So Kevin and I, you know, go way back, and actually Kevin started zero um i had gone through some medical challenges and used fasting as part of that therapy and kevin saw the success i had using fasting decided while i was at fitbit um after selling fit start of them he decided to go out and build like a weekend project and it was a very simple but recognizable manifestation of zero today just a timer and he could track fast and this is back in 2017 i think um, and then when I left Fitbit and decided I wanted to go headlong into this world and Kevin wanted to go work at True and, and kind of a demanded zero, I took it over. So Kevin's the creator of the ah. original product. Um, and I went to True in April of True Ventures in April of 2018, where Kevin was then a, a venture partner and uh, Tony Conrad, who's our board member now, and went to them and said, hey, I have a vision for this. Um, Kevin, why don't I take it over? We'll do a seed round of funding and then you stay involved as, um, you know, as the original creator and part of the investment team. And that's how it's stood until today. And he's very involved in, um, you know, the future reviews and ideas for the product going forward. You you hired him as a marketing associate, associate. when he was like 20 years old. He, he just answered a, a Craigslist ad and uh, you've been pretty good at hiring talent. Tell me about that moment in time when Kevin Rose comes walking into your office at the age of 20, his age, yeah. of course. And what did you think? Well, I mean, Kevin and I have been friends for 20 years now. That was back in around 2000. Yeah. I was at a CMGI company and I didn't really know what I was doing. I was director of marketing. I had left Intel 
um, as a, a, a marketing manager, kind of a rank and file employee, first startup, first you know head of marketing job for me, um, and I knew I needed uh, some help, um, really on the marketing side, but analysis and product ideas, and I had a small budget, small headcount, and I put an ad in Craigslist, I think, or Monster, one of the early job boards. Kevin called me up. Um, he, we kind of instantly had a rapport and he seemed really on the ball, even though his career was just getting off the ground. I think I was his first, first or second boss and he just made a great impression. And my gut told me, you know, maybe I'm taking a flyer on this guy, but, um, I usually trust my gut on these things, which has proven to be generally good. And I brought him out to San Francisco. He was in Vegas, brought him out to San Francisco and very quickly, he became kind of my right hand, um, helped us you know, grow the company, even though the, the eventual outcome wasn't great for the company. Um, and we became mostly really good friends. So I saw the writing on the wall for that company, left, Kevin stayed, but we remained friends um, you know, up until today. So you brought him to the ship, then you abandoned ship, and then he- <laughs> yeah. He I, never lets me forget that. Yeah, no, I uh, I know that. And so, but you had worked at CMGI, which is hilarious for people who don't know. Twenty five years ago, a, na a guy named David Weatherall, am I mm -hmm. correct? Is that the right guy? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember I so. interviewed him when I was a journalist. I think he was up in Boston on that Route One Twenty Eight kind of uh, Boston tech circle. But CMGI was essentially like a SoftBank slash Y Combinator hybrid where they would start their own internet companies. They had billions of dollars in cash and they were publicly traded, I believe. They and I they so. had hit like a $50 billion market. Something insane. Them and Vertical Net. There were a couple of these. Idea Lab was going to go public. And the idea was they, it was a startup studio, right? Yeah, they were the poster child for you know startup studio slash. I don't know what their exact thesis was. I didn't work for CMGI proper. I worked. For, I was a portfolio company yeah. of them, um, but they just spread dollars and were riding the wave of you know no fundamentals in these companies. Um, eyeballs. Everything was eyeballs based. Yep. I still remember to this day that was the the catchphrase of the time. And I mean, they were sponsoring stadiums for you know fifty million dollars and. Just doing all the things that have become kind of memes or, or, or mythology of that time, and um, yeah, we were we were in that circle. And then it, you know, as as fast as it went up, it it cratered. And and it was during that crater time that I thought, okay, I've got a I've got a rent to pay. I'm in San Francisco, and um, left Kevin. He stayed a little bit longer, but eventually went on to his own great. And this career. was what 2002 or something. This is. 2000, 2001. Oh, so before the dot com yeah. crash, right? Because CMGI was still, it still was right existing. before the crash. It yep. was really interesting when you think about that moment in time. And I really haven't thought or talked on this podcast about the dot com era in five or 10 years, maybe. Maybe we talked about it in the beginning because it's such ancient history. But we're old timers. We can, we, we can relate to this. Well, just think about this for a second, Mike. When you think about capturing eyeballs, that's engagement, that's intention, that's attention, which is exactly what Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube are based on today. Because mm -hmm. that engagement turns into advertising. Uh, the only thing they got wrong was that it was really the data, right? It wasn't just the engagement. It was the engagement data. What did people watch? What did they engage with? Which is really interesting. They got it right, and they went really well, big. Well, no, there was no sense of unit economics either. Like, the, you know, today, right. you can look at eyeballs and engagement as top of funnel, but then what does it accrue to? Right. Uh, and I, that's where there was no answer. People had no historical information on how much a user was worth. So right. a company with a million users, we now know, if you're Facebook, Twitter, whatever, we can actually tell you in which country how much they make per user per month. Mm -hmm. And it's five bucks or 10 bucks or $3 or 30 bucks a year. So you could actually value a business based on that today. But they got so much right, if you think about it. It was just the timing wasn't sustainable and the way they were putting capital. I wonder if people will look at SoftBank as that moment in history as well, or if SoftBank will get it right because there actually is a there there in a lot of the companies they invested in. Well, what I think, you think you're right. I mean, if you look at, you know, pets.com was the poster child, right? Mm. For, you know, the, the web one that, oh, how are you going to ship dog food? Um, you know, the economics didn't make sense and they imploded. And now you look at Chewy. Right. And, uh, you know, so fast forward to, um, you know, Easier to stand up technology, cloud, um, really looking at the funnel and unit economics, um, the infrastructure around shipping, 
uh, I mean, it, it, it's working now. Yeah, um, Amazon, one point five trillion dollar company, right? I mean, who, who yeah. would have known that the bookstore would have actually taken over the world, as it were? Uh, so, Kevin and you, you go down to EA. Uh, yeah, you learn a lot there about video games. That's when. I guess you go to LA. That's where EA's headquarters was, right? In Playa Vista at that time? Started in Redwood City where their HQ is. Ah, right. Um, and then did a couple of years down in LA. Um, you know, in EA's a juggernaut today. EA was, you know, the leading publisher when I was there. A lot more competition now and everything switched to mobile and, and online. But um, I mean, I just learned an incredible amount at that place. The, the rigor they put around launches, um, the size and scale of the revenue and, and the, the audience, um, that was really where I cut my teeth and how to, how to run a business or at least part of a business at scale with really smart people around me. I was more of a minion at Intel where I was in the late nineties, but EA is where I finally got a lot more responsibility and, and, and learned a, a ton that I brought with, with me until today. And you were responsible for marketing these games, which the marketing would be millions, tens of millions of dollars in marketing at that time, and they would make tens of millions or low hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue? A title? Well, I think the marketing... So usually the formula was around 10% of the revenue would go toward marketing, you know, give or take. And so with Lord of the Rings franchise, I think we worldwide, we did a billion dollars um, or the, wow. thereabouts uh, because we had multiple titles and on multiple platforms. Um, and so a hundred million dollars would not have been out of the realm of possibility for marketing there. Amazing. It's a hundred million dollar budget, but people don't remember back then there's no Facebook. I think Google might not even be taking ads. Maybe they're just starting to. So really you're buying print, television, and radio. Is that right? Or maybe yeah. AOL I mean, portal ads. So we did what we called the air war. Um, there's a ground war and an air war. The ground war was talking to the community, doing PR, um, you know, things like that, which was much more limited then because you had like message boards, you didn't have Facebook, you didn't have all the methods that we have to talk to sort of insiders. But the air war was where the action was at. And that was traditional advertising. So you, TV was the big lion's share of the, of the marketing budget. Um, and then print ads like Game Informer, PC Magazine, that was where you would, wow. you would have these beautiful, large Full color ads, multi-page, beautiful ads, back cover, like these gatefold yeah. ads, and gorgeous. I used actually, to sell them. Silicon Hour Reporter. I was in that biz. Yeah, I mean, and and look, we've moved on, and the the media is way more efficient and more engaging and, and and more interactive. But there was something about you know waiting for that magazine to show up in your mailbox, oh, it's a great opening experience. up this game, and and the, and it really added to the mystery because you didn't have all this information leaking on the web you that's where you got your news and you got your reviews about games and it, so, it invoked a lot of uh, uh emotions right it was like a very powerful media magazines people forget the the power of like looking at the table of contents or the back page yeah. or you know a particular uh columnist column it's really there's something lost in that art form you know i, I cut my teeth on, on magazines in the early days so it's like vinyl it's like it's, it's like, like vinyl, vinyl. Right. yeah it, it's it's I often just, uh, think if somebody started a magazine today about apps or startups or, you know, digital media, a magazine about digital media today that was a luxury product, like $30 a magazine, like um, the magazine books trend in uh, Japan where they're keepsakes, I think it would do wonderful. I don't know if it could get to a million subs or 100,000 subs like, you know, apps do all the time, but uh, it certainly is fascinating when you think about that art form just going away. Like I know. It's just gone. Maybe it'll come back like vinyl. Maybe that maybe, maybe that could be something you dabble in. No, it's too, it's so <laughs> painful. Uh, when we get back to this quick break, I, I want to get back to how you priced it. And I also want to hear the story of Dig. Uh, so we're going to get into that when we get back on this week in Startups. Hey, everybody. Are you ready to upgrade your workstation? It's time, and I can get you up to 48% off right now if you go to dell.com slash twist. Yes, Dell for Entrepreneurs is an actual program run by my friends over at Dell. You know I love my Dell laptop. I got the Chrome OS on this one. I got these giant Dell monitors all over the office, and I've been a fan of Dell forever, um, especially the widescreen monitors. I love those, and I love the laptops having all the ports on the side, USB-C, the old USB ports. 
uh, HDMI cables, Ethernet ports, all built in. No dongle life for me. I got the whole this shebang right here on this laptop. And what they do with Dell for Entrepreneurs is they're trying to support founders by providing resources and financing and tools to help your startup grow with their technology. So if you're scaling your company, that doesn't mean just hiring. You know, you're going to have to get high quality laptops, monitors, storage, all that important stuff, networking, printers, and you're probably going to have to send this to people to build their home offices right now. And what an amazing moment it is when you send one of your team members a beautiful chair or a beautiful desk. And of course, that beautiful curved 38 inch Dell monitor. All of my people have those not only at work, they have them at home. And they've always had them at home because I want them to be super productive. And they will give you also free IT consulting with experts. And they will help you do things like analyze your cloud spending and save you money. You're probably spending too much. Of course, Dell has Dell Financial Services. What this means is qualified founders can finance their entire hardware project and pay for it in low monthly installments. What an amazing thing to do. Don't blow all your capital on buying a bunch of new machines. Pay for it monthly over time. Great idea. And these Dell machines are up to 48% off right now, this summer, right now. Get there. Dell.com slash twist. Twist listeners can get up to 43% off. And take that extra 5% off right now at dell.com slash twist. Thanks to Dell for making awesome products that I personally love and I've been using for decades, as well as running a great company and providing this great support to the founder community that's part of the Speed of Startups. It really means a lot to me. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, Mike Mazur is here, the CEO of Big Sky Health. Uh, and Kevin, you know, Kevin Rose, a friend of the show, friend of mine, uh, launched uh, this zero fasting app back in the day. Mike took it over, got funding from my friend, Tony Conrad, who was also the investor in Fitbit, which launched at one of my events um, and a friend of mine as well. They backed it and they have a trio of products, um, uh, Oak Meditation, Less, uh, a mindful drinking app so you, you consume less alcohol and uh, Zero, which I think is the, the tip of the spear and the big one uh, in this, which you should try and you should go pay for Zero. Uh, it's called Zero Plus, the paid product. What do you call it? Zero Plus. Zero yep. Plus, got it. Um, and so how did you get the pricing? You, you, you came to $70, like six bucks a month, something like that, uh, when you pay by year? a month, yeah. 70 a year. Um, and we had a launch a launch price of 49 a year for our all of our existing users so they could come in. I got in on um, that, yeah. Good. I'm yeah. glad to hear that. Yeah. Are you enjoying the product? I mean, you- I, I, Yeah, I really, just on the advanced product, it wasn't what I wanted. Um, but well, I was what do you delighted. Want? I want to hear about that. Well, I emailed I you about- early. I emailed Kevin early on, and he cc'd you. What I want is I have a iMessage thread where me and my brother, who's lost yep. 15 pounds fasting, and my other friend Mike Savino, who we invest together as a venture partner at my firm, uh, we would just post our results from our fast and just kind of give each other encouragement, and then we would kind of drop off for a month, and then we get back on it. And I want to have all three of the fasting circles synced so we can all do our fast together and have like the Fitbit, Fitbit com- competition because there's a, there is a section in Fitbit where I got into these challenges, work, the challenges, work week hustle, weekend, single day, whatever. And Peloton has that same dynamic. It's not so much for competition. I'm not trying to beat anybody. Support. Uh, it's more for chat. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's just more for being in it together and like, yeah. You know, when I would be a runner, I would run with people who, who I was the slowest runner in the group, but I ran my fastest times, right? Which tells you something, right? Well, um, well let's break a little news on on the show. Okay. Um, what? what? Yeah. Um, we, breaking news. please. <laughs> Go ahead. We are um, very close to rolling out um, exactly what you're talking about. Oh, um, fantastic. With, with challenges and with your friends, mm. um, you know, there'll be group challenges, but also these kind of tighter social circle challenges. And Perfect. That's um, my team has no idea I'm talking about this, but yes. it, it's, it's so on point with what you're looking for and what yeah. I'm looking for and what a ton of yeah. people are looking for that can't, can't help myself. So yeah, do it. We Will are it be that, the, are you going to do the thing where the circles are matched? So like, you know, how Apple has the circles. Yeah. Kind of go. If I would love to see like all of us on the same circle, we'll be on the same circle with our pictures. Or you something. won't be on the same circle, but you'll see, hmm. you know, your circle versus your friend's circle. Perfect. Um, and there'll be um, initially we'll have um, kind of 
preset challenges that we set up, right. but then you'll be able to, to do custom bespoke challenges with you and your friends. So it's it's been on our roadmap forever. Um, you know, we know people want this more community. You know, you yeah. see the number of people fasting, but you want to actually interact with them and yeah. get that encouragement. So that is imminently coming. I love it. Thank you for breaking that. I mean, and, and I, I understand why you went with the coach and the education piece first, because I was going to Tim Ferriss's podcast or, I, you know, listen, I'm friends with Tim. I was texting with Tim, asking him questions about fasting. So like, uh, and he'd be like, you can read my books. And I was like, no, I'm friends with you, Tim. You just <laughs> answer my goddamn questions on text. Like, why would I read your books? Like, aren't we friends? Just, tell me. Just tell me what to do. He's like, I have like yeah. six chapters on this. Uh, <laughs> I was like, when you ask me about angel investing, I answer the questions. I don't tell you read my book. Uh, but, you know, I kind of had to do my own research on it. And, you know, like a pop over to Joe Rogan, pop over to Tim Ferriss, pop over to Kevin Rose's podcast. But so I understand, like, you put it all in the app. That's kind of table stakes. But, yeah, these challenges are going to make it go crazy. And, of course, that's a premium feature. So you'll, I think you'll convert at the rest of the folks. And I, it's kind of an interesting, uh, easy there'll to be pay some, for. There'll be some for free, too. Like, we, we are very committed to democratizing this practice. I yeah. mean, I think... You know, going through what I went through in my own experience with fasting, we just want a lot of people fasting. Got it. And um, and then it's a, it's incumbent upon us to create real value, not bullshit. Like, yeah. you know, we try and trick you into upgrading, like real value for that paid tier. So some of these things will will be free, um, and some will be paid with with enhancements. Yeah, well, I mean, if you if the free basic, you know, like hey, we're in a competition together, or we're sharing our stats. That makes the product viral, right? Which it isn't viral now. So you get a little virality, which is good for you. That's word of mouth is our virality right now. It's yeah. Nothing in the product. Nothing in the, I mean, literally I've turned 10 people onto the product just by saying, Thank and my you. brother, my friend, Mike Savino, people on our team, um, because it is so great. And uh, when you think about pricing, that was another thing we were, I wanted to get yeah. out of you. You know, the $70 a year, it's yep. the exact price of a A-list title video game. Uh, yep. it's half the price of a Netflix subscription. How do you think consumers think about this as best as you can tell? There, it's, a, it's a phenomenal question and there's no perfect answer. I, for, for us, we went about it a, a couple different ways. One, the easiest way for anyone you know, developing a, a new app to launch is look in your category, um, so health and fitness in our case, and just look at your peers, um, look at, you know, your nearest neighbors and see who's having success and, and where they're pricing. So that's, that's like table stakes where you start. Um, so calm, I think is, you know, there's some analogs between fasting and meditation. We have content. Most of our competitors do not have content. So you kind of can start there. And then you, you look at also, you mentioned if you went to a dietitian. well, in our case, we have, uh, Dr. Peter Atia, who's architecting both the coach programs. He and his, actually, it's he and his team of like six or seven people have had a direct hand and will continue to have a direct hand in our coach algorithms, recording all of the content, all the knowledge they've amassed over their, you know, 100 plus aggregated years of knowledge. If you tried to become a patient of Peter, which I don't think he's taking new patients, it's a lot of money, right? And so if we can take the greatest hits, kind of the 80% of what Peter, how Peter would onboard you into his practice from a you know fasting perspective, which is a big part of his practice, and kind of bottle that and give you that feedback loop and that content. Like, you know, we're one percent of the cost. That way less than that. Yeah. So, no, I mean he would um, he would be a lot of money to, to do a personal consultation. That's right. So yeah. we try to anchor on I mean, obviously we can't anchor on that. But that's, I think, the value exchange is if and if people are, are, are sort of seeing that. And that's what Peter wanted. Peter wanted to scale himself. He, right. he can only see so many patients. He sees how powerful this intervention is for metabolic health, uh, for, for weight management, for, for cancer prevention. More and more, as the science is showing, um, you know, what's that worth? And I think our, our users um, they look at this as a lifestyle, not a diet. So 75% of our users, we polled them. They say fasting is a lifestyle, but I want to learn way more about it. They're kind of predisposed to wanting to dig in and 70 bucks a year. Yeah. Maybe it's the cost of a video game. This is a year of that knowledge that we're always improving upon. I think, you know, we're seeing in our metrics that it feels like the right price. 
And we're also running a ton of pricing experiments. So anyone out there who's grappling with this question like we did, you know, we, we have a whole infrastructure um, around, you know, annual versus monthly pricing, free trial, no free trial. Um, and you can pretty quickly over, you know, we've, we've been at this for eight weeks now in market. We're, we're honing in pretty quickly on that economic curve of, um, you know, what people are willing to pay, what the lifetime value LTV is. Um, but I think anchoring on your peers is probably the quickest shortcut to get to Which a is pricing. What and then Disney did, right? Will tell you. Yeah, the business will tell you, and and renewals yeah. will tell you next year. That's right. And, and every month we're getting renewal data. So yeah, I mean, selling monthly is just, I think, the worst idea it's, because it's tough. It's well, tough. you know, the, I I think putting the yearly price uh, at two to three, the the yearly price at one third of the monthly price yeah. is where people are going to get to because. If you are forcing people to make a 12 time a year decision, it's too much cognitive overhead. It's too much cognitive overload. It makes people anxious. Whereas if you grossly underprice it and they pay once a year, then when year two comes around and if they used it twice, it's fine, right? So that I think that's the double edged sword of maximization of revenue. And I think that's a very astute comment. And I yeah. think that we are, you know, we're really anchoring toward that. I think right now we're at around a half. Um, We'll continue to play with our pricing where it's maybe a half or closer to a third of, of monthly. Yeah. And the other dynamic is we know we're at the beginning and we're going to keep adding a ton of value to this product. We're not resting on our laurels. We have an entire year, if someone subscribes annually, to really just get them even more stoked when yep. that annual subscription renews. And we also don't have Apple emailing you every month saying, Okay, your monthly things were billing again. That's they the send cognitive you that email. overload that I can't handle. Yeah. I, I just pay for yeah. everything yearly now. And I'm just like, the yearly is such a better value. And I encourage all our startups to just go with yearly because and, and grossly underprice it because there's so many users out there. If you look at what Apple, I'm sorry, Disney did to Netflix, I think the introductory price I paid for Disney was seven dollars a month. Uh, I think I and got if a free they, with Verizon. You got a free with Verizon, yeah. If they had said to me you could buy it for five years at $7 a month, uh, which would have been 60 months times seven, you know, I, I would have done it. I would have done it. I would have paid the 450 or whatever it winds up being. You know, I would have just been like, yeah, I'll pay it for, for five years. Like, going to be watching Disney and Star Wars and Pixar films yeah. for the next five years. And that just takes, you think about the the base of users that com.com has, and full disclosure, we're investors in the company. Um from the seed round. So, uh, but we have a Steezy, a dance company, and we have Fitbod, a fitness company, both doing incredibly well. And I think if you look at their Do price- Do they not have monthly at all? Or they just- I think they all have, charge. I think you have to order, you have to offer monthly, but I think the pricing- It's so attractive to go annual. It's so attractive that you're like, ah, eh, four, when, when it's four months, you know, so when it's 40 bucks or 50 bucks, I think for people, it's just such an easy decision to make. If yeah. you use it twice, they get enough value. I actually subscribe to- I think early on, like some uh, video service for like foreign films, Voodoo or something or video. I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, I'd signed up for it for a year and I watched like two movies and I was like, oh, it paid for itself. Uh, right. <laughs> even though it and was- And Calm has a, Calm, you're an investor and has, they have a lifetime skew. We've grappled. Yeah, I think it's, what is their skew? lifetime? 300 bucks? I think it's 300 bucks. Yeah, I remember when they sent that experiment, I was like, I just forwarded it to Alex and I was like, brilliant. Because think about it, you can always turn it off when you hit a million of them. Right. You know? I'm That's like, right. Okay, yeah, the next nine million will pay. Uh, but there's, this is something special is going on here with consumer subscriptions where consumers are willing to pay for software again. What do you think is behind that? Well, I think the software has gotten materially better in, I mean, they've always been willing to pay for video games and that's content. I think in the health and fitness space, product, I mean, when I started at Fitstar, production values were horrible. And, you know, Fitstar partly was a success because of our production values, which was a direct lineage back to my video game days where production value really mattered. I think the, um, the machine learning and AI to serve up content that's relevant to you um, is, is also infinitely better. And I think users are finally getting value from these. I mean, I'm, I'm talking specifically about health and fitness, but in general, if they're deriving if they're driving value or having their life improve through these products, then I, I think the value exchange is 50 bucks a year, 60 bucks a year. I'm happy to pay it. And I, so that's, I think, I think, I think the most the interesting point, Mike, is that outcomes 
from phenomenal, I think you said really two really interesting things there. Um, the first, uh, I think people don't think about enough, which is the production value. You know, in video games, the artwork, the music, the voiceover, like they really pull out all the stops and they think of it like, because of the revenue numbers, like a, a major production, like a movie. Whereas in apps, people just think, what's the least I can spend? And that's my, you know, control costs. But outcomes is really the interesting thing because during COVID, what we saw was all the SaaS companies had this like 10%, 20% pullback. And it was a pullback, uh, I think like an acceleration, you know, I'm talking about business subscriptions of people who weren't getting the outcome and COVID just made them look at their bills, right? I'm just going right. to review my bills. I'm going to, I don't know how long the stock market crashed. I don't know how long it's going to last. So let's do a quick audit. Let's check the ledger. What can I turn off? And now I, with my teams, I put all of our SaaS billing onto like a credit card uh, that uh, has a cap and that we can just turn off that one credit card, like they're burner cards. So that if we don't want to, if we want to stop paying for this particular product or these products, you just put That's the SaaS really card at one dollar a month. And I then need they, a burner card in my personal life too. Yeah, there's, there's a there's a bunch like, of companies. Do not pay privacy.com. A bunch of them now exist. We can create these burner cards, um, and I think banks are going to wind up doing it. There's Divi for business that we tried. We've tried three or four of them, um, and I, I, ha I don't have an endorsement yet, um, and nobody's sponsoring the program yet. So, uh, <laughs> but I, I think they all basically do the same thing, which is here's a card for you, and you could do it. You can do unlimited cards, so you could make a card just for your net subscription. So I did that for the first one I tested was the Wall Street Journal. You ever try to unsubscribe from the Wall Street Journal? Impossible. Impossible. And I emailed Rupert Murdoch about it, like literally. I I emailed. I was like, "You guys are taking my money." Uh, <laughs> sorry to make the guys laugh. I just emailed him and I was like, "Rupert, this thing doesn't make sense to me. Like, <laughs> you take our money through a web form, but you won't let us unsubscribe through a web form for security reasons." Because that's what the woman on the phone said to me. I said, "Can I ask you a, a stupid question? Why do I have to call you to unsubscribe when you'll take my money?" She said, "Oh, because of security reasons, obviously." I said, isn't unsubscribing more secure? Like that's less of a worry than being subscribed. And like dead silence, she goes, I just work here, sir. And I was like, <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to turn to a Karen on the phone. Um, but it seems like Apple's, that was the other thing people were saying was the subscription changes at Apple and giving more control to people and surfacing the subscriptions and sending that monthly yeah. billing um, yeah. was going to cause problems. And I think it's the opposite. It's built trust. It's the I think opposite. So too. It, it, Apple really made that stuff opaque. I, I, you know, I'm obviously, you know, run a company. I'm heavily involved. I remember trying to tap through nine menus to. Yeah, where do you find it? To, yeah, it's like your Apple ID, and then you're down a rabbit hole. But I, I think that's um, that's important, right? And you like, I think the companies that are durable and that last, you know, it's like they make it as easy to unsubscribe, and maybe they don't put it in front of your face, but like, don't try and trap someone. No, um, don't be a and, cable uh, company. Yeah. And I think that, you know, uh, what did Rupert say? Did he write back? He didn't. Uh, okay. Shocking. But, you know, I, I, I'll tell you another time I pulled my uh, celebrity card, my micro celebrity card, is uh, my NBA League Pass. Uh, oh, my God. I, was that disastrous thing, I, in the I'm first still two years. Being billed. Yeah, I still had disastrous billed. billing. And I said, hey, wait a second. I signed up. And then the billing went up like $100. So I uh, emailed Adam Silver, the commissioner <laughs> of the NBA. And I said, Adam, what's going on here? Like, I never agreed to this. And you raised my billing. And uh, it doesn't work, by the way. It, you're blocking out every Knicks game. Uh, this thing is not worth paying for unless I can get all my Knicks games. Like, I, this is just too confusing. Uh, and, you, and you charge an extra 100 bucks from what I paid. And uh, one of his people emailed me back and said, you have a two free huh? year subscription. Uh, Adam appreciates the feedback. Uh, so that was kind of cool. Uh, That's cool. Yeah, see, CEOs. I don't have out. those emails I can write. And I'm get, I've been being double billed somehow by Netflix for, I just checked my credit cards. Like I did what you said, like going through my credit card stuff. I've been double billed by Netflix for like 18 months. Here, when we get back from this quick break, I'm going to tell you how to solve all your reoccurring Please. credit card issues when we get back on this week. Hey everybody, do you like modern furniture? I do, and I am in love with a company called Modloft. You may have heard of them. They make gorgeous, really well-built, elegant, but affordable modern furnishings. And 
I have one of their beautiful tables in my home, and then I have another table that was imported, and I get more compliments on the one that costs a fraction of the cost of the imported one from Italy. I kid you not. It is amazing. I love Mod Loft because these are built to last and they're beautiful and they're a fraction of the cost. And also Mod Loft offers a lot of cool services like risk-free at-home trials and they deliver in days, not months. We're team in stock. We're looking for stuff that's in stock so we can get it there. We don't want to wait six months. And their prices are spectacular. Even though they've won all these international design awards, they will give you free interior design consulting to fit your style and they have exceptional customer service. I know this because the Modlo folks reached out to me at some point and they said, hey, we're big fans of your podcast. And I said, I'm big fans of yours. And we're like, oh, okay, let's do something together. And here we are. Modloft will furnish your entire home from your bedroom to living room, dining room, and outdoor with stunning items that will leave you and your guests in awe. Get in there and go visit modloft.com slash twist for 15% off and free shipping. That's why founders, venture capitalists, pro athletes, and top recording artists all choose Modloft, including me. So thanks to Modloft for supporting this week in startups and uh, for making great products, candidly. I love the products. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, Mike Mazur is here. Uh, gosh, I mean, I, I literally need to have you on the show for like two hours because you've had such a career. Uh, another way of saying you're old and you got the you got the scars from <laughs> web 1.0 web 2.0 web 3.0 and now whatever we're in now uh, maybe it's just called business now it's doesn't need to be carved out uh, but we were talking about the reoccurring subscription hacks um, it turns out when you cancel your credit card they keep your number so you as a feature and I don't know if it's a feature um, I they you still get your uh, bills Right. So if your credit card gets stolen and you redo your credit card. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, I had this with Amex. So had I like with Amex. lost my card. Then they keep yeah. billing me. Yeah. So here's what you do. You cancel the card. You just cancel the card. And then you get a new card that has the ability to have burner cards. And then you see who in the family or the company or you yourself, what you miss. Because there's nothing on there that's a showstopper. And trust me, when you're on a subscription, when we did that with our SaaS bills, we got a lot of phone calls really fast. And I was like, oh my God, somebody from the company bought this and we never looked at it? I think every company, if they're not using burner cards, should cancel all credit cards and start over every year. It should be part of the financial part. So you're so, getting- So is a burner card like a certain type of card or you just allocate this Chase Visa is going to be a burner card? Uh, no, you take your bank account, you connect it to the service. Or you can, okay. and then they say, here's a card number, here's a card number, here's a card number. Give this card number a name. And I called it Wall Street Journal. And then I set it to $1. And then what I did was I, they'll let you change your card at Wall Street Journal. So I went to the Wall Street Journal, I changed my card to the burner. And then the very next month, I stopped getting billed. I didn't need to call them on the phone. I need this. It worked so well. I was like, oh. And I think this is going to become the standard is to put it, and this is what happens when you squeeze too tight. I think this is like one of the things people learn. You squeeze customers too tight, they come up with really interesting solutions like BitTorrent, you know, or Napster, or, you know, Do Not Call, right? We had uh, the, the kid from Do Not Call uh, on the pod. Yeah, that was a great episode. So you had a health scare, and you're willing to talk about it. So let's yeah. go there. Let's yeah. talk about the health scare, how that introduced you to fasting, because I realize we haven't actually even talked about fasting itself and why this has become a trend. Now, we know that in our community, people are uh, into the quantified self, and that started 10 years ago or 12 years ago with Fitbit and other things that you would clip to your belt and get your steps. So I don't think we need to talk about that piece. But fasting specifically, I saw my friend Phil Libin, who was fatter than me. I mean, he was big. Lose a hundred pounds. And I was like, Phil, what happened? And he said to me, fasting. This is three years ago. And I said, I'm so impressed. We have to go get coffee. Went and got egg bites at uh, Starbucks, the sous vide egg bites. And he said, uh, here, let me explain to you all about fasting. And then I heard Kevin and Tim talk about it. So tell me about how you discovered fasting and what fast, why fasting is becoming a phenomenon. Yeah. Um, so the short, shorter story of that is um, my road into fasting is uh, very different, thankfully, than most people's. 
Um, most people get into it for kind of some kind of weight loss. That's a very common entry point, the most common entry point. My road was different. So when I was in the midst of selling Fitstar to Fitbit, this is fall of 14. I had been feeling really kind of ill, kind of like flu and fatigue and just not well at all. And, um, you know, the Fitbit deal was going through and within a week of getting uh, Fitbit's um, statement that they wanted to buy the company, I hadn't got a term sheet yet, but they said, we want to buy you. And they were, they were serious because they've been looking at us for a while. Um, a week later, I got diagnosed with um, Nod Hodgkin's lymphoma. Wow. Basically what I, you know, we, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. They did an ultrasound and they said, you've got lymphoma and it, it looks like it's, you know, significant. And so um, I went through, I went to Stanford, amazing institution, had, you know, great conventional medicine, very blessed to have that. But I, I didn't want to just go through the standard protocol without digging in and figuring out how I could be the best patient, how I could stack the deck in my favor with things that I would do in my lifestyle while I'm going through treatment. And I came along the work of um, a guy named Dr. Walter Longo. Um, he had done some very early work in applying fasting um, to mice that had cancer and were going through chemotherapy. And his hypothesis was, which has turned out to be true, if you are in a fasted state, and we're talking multi-day fast, like five days, your cells go into uh, a mode called autophagy. It's like, here it is, right? Yeah. Autophagy sells itself, which is a protective state for your healthy cells. But the fast dividing cancer cells have one mission, which is to take over the host, keep dividing. And so because your fasted cells slow down or are in a protected state and the cancer cells are fast dividing and, and going fast, it creates a bigger differential mm. for the chemotherapy to properly target the cancer cells. And that just made sense to me. I watched a YouTube video. It was like in his basement of USC uh, in the School of Gerontology. It was like this homegrown video. But of all the stuff that I looked at on my own, that was the one that made sense. And I felt like there was very little downside. I wasn't emaciated. I had enough body mass to, to take on a fast if I had the discipline. And that's what I did. So I did five-day fast for each of my six chemo treatments. So 30 total days of fasting over about three or four so months. So you ate doctor, nothing. You just drank liquids, uh, water. water, five days before and bouillon, which is just beef. Salt. Yeah. It's no calories, it's just yeah. electrolytes. So I would do two days before the, the treatment the, to get into that state of autophagy. Right. The day of treatment so that the, the chemo could target the cancerous cells more effectively. And then two days after, so that when I introduced food, I wasn't creating any kind of a growth signal mm. when my stem cells were being produced after that third day of fasting, which happens after a long fast, you get stem cells. So giving them a kind of a pure environment. And I'm sure I'm botching some of the science here, but that was the, the general gist. And I got, um, they did a scan after two of the six, the first two of the six treatments, they do a sort of a progress yep. scan, a PET scan. And they had no, they couldn't show any evidence of cancer. Whoa. Um, it, had, it had sort of gone into remission. Now I went through the rest of the treatment because that's the playbook. Um, and you know, doctors stick with the playbook for a very good reason, but it was incredible. It was, you know, and and also my um my response to the chemo fasting, because one time I broke early, mm -hmm. um, my response to the chemo was much less um kind of painful and and nauseating when I did the fasting versus when I introduced food early in my in my treatment. So um, and there's been, what, there's been studies for a long time. The science on calorie restriction is yeah. very clear that calorie restriction in mice and other folks, uh, or, or I don't even know if they've done human trials on this. I, I don't know how you do a human trial. Biosphere 2. If you remember uh, Biosphere 2, where the scientists went in Arizona and they uh, of really? lived in a bubble for two years, they were all calorie restricted. Oh. There's, there's some Mixed. different opinions on calorie restriction especially if it's sustainable from a lifestyle standpoint um and the nice thing about fasting and, and the reason so that was my introduction and i yeah. thought then i went nerded out on the lifestyle benefits the metabolic benefits uh, what the are the benefits take, take us through each of those 
Sure. So, and, and this is really what we've been working on with Peter. So the, the most clear one is, um, is really managing your levels of glucose. Mm. And if you're pre-diabetic, meaning if you have uh, a glucose that's between, I think, 100 and 150, um, you know, when you, when you do a finger prick or you go to the doctor, you, know, you can be in a pre-diabetic state. And if you don't make lifestyle changes, that can turn into type 2 diabetes. So there's really compelling evidence that fasting manages down your glucose um, on a sustained basis. Hmm. Um, so that's, that's one clear benefit. There's a lot of science emerging around um, coronary disease and also around um, Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. So all, what, what Peter Atia uh, calls the four horsemen, which is cancer, coronary disease, um, diabetes and Alzheimer's, you know, he's a firm believer in the science is showing that fasting can really accrue to be preventative or at least help you if you have them in those, um, in those maladies. Which is so, fascinating, makes direct And we have thousands sense. of users, yeah. thousands of users, Jason, that have told us that they have reversed their type two diabetes using zero and fasting. Now we're a consumer grade app. We're not a medical grade app. Everyone taking this on should consult with a doctor in yeah. any regard, especially if they have type two diabetes. But thousands of these people have told us they reversed their type two diabetes. Yeah, which people so, have talked about that for a long time. That in the willpower is the issue. So, what are your thoughts on willpower in relation to this? And do you think about that in terms of the app design? I'm, I'm certain you do. We do. I mean, we we try to you know we try not to push people beyond what you know, that's a, it, it's a fine line between discomfort and, and pushing through that discomfort and, and truly listening to your body on when to stop. But the willpower game is really one, I think with fasting, and you've probably discovered this for yourself, the diets for last the last 50 years have been, you know, what to eat, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of religion on paleo versus keto versus the South Beach diet. And, yeah. and you're sort of all day, like trying to figure out what levers to pull and what you can eat and what you can't eat. It just gets very overwhelming and complicated. That depletes willpower and discipline. Yes. The magic of fasting, which is the when, because it's so binary, once you build up a little bit of a muscle for fasting, it actually becomes super easy. You just don't eat in this window. There's no decision fatigue. And then you set your goal of maybe it's 16 hours, maybe it's 36 hours. And you just know when you can eat again. And I think that's the biggest unlock. That was the unlock discipline. for me. I lost like 15 pounds doing it. And it was just, and then I came back a little bit and I'm going to get back on it. Uh, but for me, it was really simple. Stop eating at six and then eat again at 10 a.m. Uh, not the end of the world, right? Because if you think about it, some number of those hours, some number of those 16 hours, I'm asleep. So I'm asleep for half those hours or so. So that's not hard. So you're really talking about just not eating for eight hours. And when, I, when you put a plate of food in front of me, well, that's a really hard decision for me. I just want to eat everything. I love food. I'm a gut bone. You, you go to the, like, here's a perfect example. When I fly, mm. uh, when, I, when I used to fly, I, right. I don't know when I'll fly when again. I ever fly again. When, yeah. I, when I would fly to the East Coast, um, I used to like, you know, eat the crap. They bring the oh. stuff around. Should I eat the cookies? Should I not eat the cookies? Oh, haagen is and coming. Oh, with the, yeah. I, know, I know you're in American business. I know you, <laughs> they got the fresh baked cookies. You just, you gave it up. You're in business class. It's okay to say. And so, yeah. Well, I, I eat whatever they brought to me. But they got and, the, specifically American. They, they put those fresh baked cookies out and they always oh, have two or three. I'm united. Extra. You're I'm United. United what is United? So I, I United does the Sundays. They do Sundays. If you make it into, if you get the bump to first class, they have the cookies and the Sundays. Got it. But, got it. Yeah, yeah. I thought but, everybody got those. I, no, <laughs> no. In the back, you get the peanuts. I got not, the not peanuts. peanuts. They most can't of my allergies. life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stop that too. But I just, I just said uh, on this trip, I'm just on this flight and the pre-flight and the post-flight. I'm just going to fast. Right. And so it, it took all the it, it, and I used to feel like shit, right? Because I would. Oh, you know, eat, eat the junk and, and then there'd be a, you know, maybe there'd be a drink or two Whoop. and you'd get to your destination. You just feel horrible. And yeah. so I just started fasting and it's a game changer. Yeah. Such a game changer. Uh, tell me about um, m and You had uh, a great experience, I think, when Fitstar sold, correct? That'd be a 
good yeah, outcome I mean, between good and great? Good and great. Yeah. Especially circumstantially, because I was, you know, I was being treated with cancer and, and the Fitbit team and the true team who are oh, right. obviously on the board of Fitbit, they they That's a material you know, that's a material you have to disclose that. So oh yeah. You were in the middle of the I, deal I, and had to tell them, hey, the founders got cancer. Dude, I was I was sitting in my you know hospital bed getting jacked up with chemo, doing red lines on the term sheet. And then I had to figure out the right moment to tell them, which was right after that. And I, yeah, I had to disclose it. And I was- That look, could kill the deal. A hundred thousand percent. So I was dealing with dying, cancer. Possibly dying, dying. And the deal died. Yeah, I, I yeah. ended up having stage four, I figured out. So I was stage four. Whoa. And I thought this is going to destroy the deal. Yeah. So like imagine my mental state at that time. And those guys, I mean, you know, I guess a, a ton of bad luck got followed by a ton of good luck and um, mm. the deal went through and they they supported me through it. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't um, know if you've read Bob Iger's book, Ride of a Lifetime. Um, and we're trying to get Bob on the podcast. I think he's going to come on. Um, and he tells the story of Steve Jobs telling him right before Pixar was being announced, like the day before, hey, I got to tell you something in confidence. Uh, my cancer's back. And Steve jo and Robert Iger is left in this crazy situation because he promised yeah. Steve Jobs, yeah, no, I won't tell anybody. Uh, and it's like only my doctor, my wife, and you know, uh, Bob Iger. Uh, so Bob's left with this choice of do, this is material information, but that our la the largest shareholder of Disney post this acquisition is going to be Steve Jobs or uh, his, his estate. Do we tell everybody? And I think where they wound it up is they didn't. Which means if the Pixar deal went south, you would have this material piece of information hanging out there that could be actionable, right? If they if they thought Jobs That's was the crazy. key employee, I didn't realize it, I didn't realize it was yeah. kept, you know, on the down. I believe I, I it was. It. Somebody fact check yeah. me, but it, the book is not super clear. But he, I think, he just decided it wasn't his place to tell everybody, um, or maybe he. Yeah, no, I think he didn't tell everybody. So it's crazy. I knew that James Park would have to, you know, digest it for himself, right. make his own analysis, and talk to the board. But I, you know, I was, I was ninety nine percent convinced it was, yeah, it was wow. gonna, it was gonna, and then, and I, how could I fundraise? I mean, it was like it would have been you're the end of the, of the company because, yeah, yeah. What's that? So, what's that like being in your forties? And you get that diagnosis and you go home on that weekend and you're with yourself. Like, what is that? What do you know about life that we don't having had that experience? Yeah. Um, it's a lot of things. I mean, it's going to sound incredibly trite, um, but I, I just really appreciate every day. Mm. And I think, um, it, and it, but it manifests in real ways. Um, you know, when I set up this company, I, I, I said, uh, if the only way I can start another company is I got to have tons of balance. Mm. Um, I've got to live where I want to live. So I live in Montana now, not the craziness of San Francisco. Um, I don't want to go into an office every day because that stresses me out. So I set mm. up the company from day one to be distributed. Um, I set my I was very intentional about how I was going to be the healthiest mentally and physically I could be um, in running another company. And that's turned out to be a blessing on many levels, but really putting myself first, not, not, mm. and that sounds selfish, but it's really just part of that appreciation of being alive, just wanting to be alive and thrive and then make my contribution in the world. And I think that that was brought home by this whole experience along with a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. That, that is, I think very instructive that people don't realize the journey is all you have at the end of the day. And we get very focused on the outcome of the startup, of the fast. And, you know, you, you have to enjoy the fast as well as the outcome that you're looking for. That's you have right. To enjoy the process. And I think that's why people get addicted to fasting when you think about it, is the lifestyle. What I hear universally from people is I've recaptured, you know, two hours a day of my time because I'm not spending it, you know, eating. You get back like an hour or two a day, which is then you can Oh my God, your, your efficiency and your time unlock is, it's hard to explain to someone that hasn't tried it. But, but just getting back to that point about what I appreciate. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess maybe instructive for, you know, 
I hope no one has to go through this journey to get to that place where they're kind of making decisions that don't compromise their health or their happiness. But, you know, to give a shout out to Tony Conrad, when I first went to him, I wasn't sure I wanted to do this. I was, mm. I still had a lot of scar tissue from what I called, I told him, I, I used to redline every day at mm. Fitstar. I was like stressed, neurotic, wasn't sleeping. And I knew I, I, I can't redline like that again. I can do it for, you know, a few seconds, but I can't, I can't sustain that. And I almost dared Tony not to invest. I said, Tony, I, I'm, I'm not going to have an office. I'm going to split time between San Francisco and Montana. And ultimately, I just moved to Montana. Um, I, I may sell this thing for like $10 million or, or, or nothing, which would be sort of a washout for you. Or I might go the long run. Yep. Like I, I couldn't give him any, like all the things that I said to get my round of funding at Fitstar, all the promises, all the, I just threw that all out the window and just said, here's what I need to be successful. Right. And if you can't invest, I totally get it. And he, I think appreciated so much that a, I knew what I wanted. Like I was very deliberate with what my ask was and, um, that I made the ask, that I was transparent and honest with him. I think that probably ultimately made it an easier decision for him. I think ultimately what we're realizing in the startup game is that, you know, experienced uh, third, fourth, fifth time, you know, at the rodeo folks, they don't need to expend as much energy, energy uh, or time to get the same result as a first timer. So That's for you sure. will have, this is my case. yeah, I mean, the, your ability to focus and to block out and delegate what is not essential. And pattern recognition has been big too. It's time. huge. Like w this time around, your ability to say no to shiny new objects and distractions <laughs> compared to when you start, thing. isn't it? Yeah. 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 I used to spend so much time on shiny objects and like spending tons of time with companies that were sniffing around like Nike. Oh, Nike sniffing around. We spent hundreds of hours, you know, nothing against Nike, but that was just my own naivete. This yeah. time we're like zoomed in. And when you're zoomed in, ultimately at a startup, what is that zooming in best spent on? So when we talk about efficiency, like Michael Jordan or Vince Carter or whatever older athlete in their, you know, last, uh, on their last startup, on their last championship run, you see them be more efficient, you know, and careful with their body. They train more. What are those things that you train more on and you're just more dialed into in terms of what matters? I think it's very episodic and very company dependent, but for, you know, I think for us and for me, it's been what, you know, what is the, you know, the P1, P2, P3 of what we need to do to get to the next chapter of growth or next phase of growth and really being much better at saying no to things that opportunistically come in, which is very exciting to see that stuff coming in and you're wondering if you're going to miss it. But, you know, for us, I'll give you an example um, in January you know, we were getting ready to launch zero plus and we had a bunch of other partnership stuff coming in and, um, investment interest. And I, we just said as a team, like nothing else matters, but getting this product out the door at quality flawlessly. And so it just, it's kind of like fasting, right? Yeah. It was binary. It was like product. This is what we had. This is what we had product operations product. Yeah. That was everything at our stage of a company. That's everything. Now that we have this product out there and we're getting product market fit and revenue. Now the game changes. Now those growth. external partnerships yeah. and growth are important. So we're reprioritizing and we just went through OKRs. I've never done OKRs with one of any of my companies setting objectives and key results. Those are very instructive and every quarter we're sort of what are the fo focus points? I know you had 15, five, the 15.5 yeah. CEO on, we use that tool for OKRs and that's been a great We're early investors. tool for us. Early and continued investors. Love it. I've invested Love in it. David's story. Uh, he's been on the podcast a couple of times. You know, it was one of these startups. I put a small amount of money in when I was starting as an angel, then put a little bit more in because the, the curve was steepening. And then somewhere in year four or five, the thing went whoop and the market yeah. was ready for it and they were ready for the market and the OKRs features got dialed we in. We love it. It was really for employee feedback originally. Yeah. How are we you used doing at work? For that. Yeah. And I was and, like, eh, you know. And now we have it for reviews and it's, yeah. it's efficient and great. That's when it. I think it became essential, right? And I, I think like, for different users, different pieces are essential. That's what's really interesting about, like for me, the challenges and the community will be interesting because I already 
you know, watched enough videos on it. Let's talk a little bit about M&A. Uh, you were famously at Dig uh, when my friend Jay Adelson was in the process of selling the company. This has all come out uh, since. Uh, the company was going to get bought for $100 million, I believe, by Marissa Mayer at Google. Google was getting inquisitive uh, about Web 2.0, wanting to buy things. And they pulled out of the deal in the last moment. What, what tell everybody the story of them pulling out of the deal, uh, why you think they did, and ultimately, you know, what you learned from the dig experience. Yeah. Um, well, Sorry. you're pulling out all the, all I the stuff. I minute the... 60. I, you know, I, I basically <laughs> left your cancer diagnosis and the dig uh, collapse. All the fun stuff all, at the yes, end. Yeah. Always in the third act because <laughs> you know what? We've talked for a little while. We built up a little mutual trust and uh, we know each other. And it feels like now we can. Yeah, no one else is listening. So yeah, we, and we've checked all the boxes about the other stuff going on. So let's get real here and have like, what's yeah. that moment like? Because you that was a big number uh, in Web 2.0. People think 100 million now and they're just like, whatever. Remember, 100 million, this is when houses in Noe Valley cost 600,000. So uh, this, this was life-changing money in a major way. That's right. And Google yeah. had, they were just getting started buying stuff. Take us through the story. Yeah, and, and Marissa... Meyer, you know, she she was, I think, running product at that point. I don't know exactly Correct. what her role, VP of product. Um, and I think that you know, she had seen what was happening with Facebook. She saw what was happening with Twitter. And I think they wanted to make a run in social media. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't, I'm not sure if they selected, uh, like they laser focused on this from the beginning. And I wasn't at the board level. I wasn't mm -hmm. um, privy to all of the way this manifest. But I think she became, you know, she had a hypothesis that um, this new way of organizing data through the lens of humans, and and they were doing Google News at that time. That was kind of a big, big deal initiative for them. Yeah. How could you kind of blend Google News and Dig to make something that was innovative and oh, next gen? I didn't realize that that's what they were thinking was. That yeah, the Dig it was very, button would go on Google News. It was or all about it was, it was very connected to Google News. Ah. So. Um, you know, they, again, I wasn't, Jay was handling the conversations with Google, but everything was going well. We had board approval, apparently. Um, and the offer was uh, made. The offer was made. They, 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 they interviewed all of the employees. I mean, they, I mean, they this had is, all we're talking about 11th, hour, not the 11th hour, the 11th and 55th minute. Yeah. Of the 11th and, hour. And word has it, I don't know if this is the truth, is that it was uh, either Larry or Sergey. You know, it came across their desk in somehow in a way that was new to them or Ooh. some detail hadn't been mm -hmm. um, properly communicated. And they just basically overruled Marissa wow. on, on the wow. deal. Yeah. And so it was this is why you always got to deal with the top person. If you're doing M&A, you always got to be dealing with the top person so you don't get the If surprise. you can, if you possibly can. If you possibly can. can. You need the rabbi. Yeah. You need the you know consigliere you need that champion but you also need to have the top bought in from the beginning or else something like this could happen yeah and, and for me that i mean I, I've, I've talked about this that was one of the most instructive pieces for me on any kind of deal m a fundraising uh, an important commercial deal is i mean it is not done until the ink is dry and the money's in the bank 100 like you just have to not count on it happening because you don't know what's going to sideswipe. It could be COVID. It could be a miscommunication in the other company. I had another situation with fundraising, M&A at Fitstar, which I can't talk about because it's under NDA, where at the 11th hour, Oof. literally the 11.59, they pulled uh, wow. a term sheet. That is crazy. So. Yeah, I mean, it just it's very instructive for founders. Listen, uh, Mike, I've taken enough of your time. Uh, everybody out there. It was fun. Yeah, I mean, I could go for another hour, but <laughs> uh, we've gone well over an hour now. Everybody go get zero fasting right now. Pay for it. It's worth it. It's life changing. Even if you just want to dabble, I, I highly recommend it. I think as a lifestyle change, I've been kind of going on and off of it, but I've had a hundred day streak was my longest fasting wow. streak. But, you know, I kept it at the 16 hour. And, I think uh, that might be longer than me as my longest streak. I, I just like the idea on a lifestyle basis because my weakness is the quantity of food I eat, uh, the inability to make good decisions about the food I eat, uh, and this late night stress eating. And it just 
checked off all those boxes for me. And so I think it'll check off a lot for you if you're listening. And Zero is the leading app. Uh, go check it out now. And if you're having too many beverages, uh, you know, you may want to check out less. Uh, no judgments there. And uh, <laughs> Oak, if you want to be mindful, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, after you pay for your comm, you can go get Oak. But uh, just so in case the, uh, the comm dog. Oak is com free. So Oak you is free. Okay, no problem. So you don't have to choose. You can, you can dabble <laughs> yeah. in Oak. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, continued success. Thanks for coming on the pod. Everybody go check out Zero Fasting. Uh, seriously, you're going to get a lot out of it. See you all next time. Bye-bye.